So as, uh, as Joe was saying, I'm a reporter for BBC News and I actually appear on your TV most days, but it's usually the back of my head <laughs> that you see as the camera travels over the newsroom. Uh, my dad actually thought that that was just kind of like on a loop, that it wasn't real time. I was like, no, I am actually in, in there somewhere. Um, or sometimes I'll walk behind the presenter to go to the canteen, and I usually text my mum and go like, right, go to the canteen now. <laughs> um, but it's sometimes a bit more glamorous than just sitting in the windowless basement that we lovingly call the pit. Uh, I've got stories to tell you, as Joe was saying, about um, going to Cannes Film Festival, sipping champagne on the beach, um, of being attended to by the Queen's personal nurse at Windsor Castle, and going to the Oscars, reporting for the news website from the red carpet. But more on those later. I thought I would just tell you a bit about my diabetes journey first. Oh, before we get to things like the Oscars, there we go, <laughs> as before mentioned. But yes, uh, back onto my diabetes journey and how I got to where I am today, um, having had diabetes for about 14 and a half years, just a year less than the amount of time that I've been a journalist. It was actually when I was moving back to Cardiff, where I'd been at university, um, for my second ever job as a junior reporter, that I got diagnosed with type 1. And funnily enough, I had had a blood glucose test queried about a year previously when I was doing my journalism course at university there. But when I told the nurses that I'd just had a Cadbury's Boost bar before the blood test, I seem to remember they were being given out free on campus and students love a freebie. There was like a new, new flavour or something. The nurses said that probably explains the high reading, seeing as they contain glucose. Now, I think it probably didn't explain the high reading, and I should have had a second blood test, but I desperately didn't want one at the time due to a fear of needles. And I know, I know a person with diabetes who has a fear of needles. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about my diagnosis when it did eventually happen after getting that job in Cardiff, because I'm still so cross about what actually happened. And I'm all about spreading the word when it comes to diabetes, both to friends, colleagues, and on social media, where I know a number of you hear from today. So when I got a job as a junior reporter at the South Wales Echo in Cardiff, to my delight, after spending 12 months at a northern newsroom, which was directly opposite a fish docks, uh, which in summer wasn't, wasn't the greatest, um, I duly registered at the local doctors. And they asked me a few basic questions, asked me to pee in a pot, the usual. But the nurse looked slightly concerned when she came back into the room and asked if I'd had any symptoms recently. And I was like, symptoms of what? And she said, you know, just symptoms. <laughs> um, yes, I'd been tired, but that was normal for a young journalist burning the candle at both ends. I hadn't been ill, I hadn't lost weight, I hadn't been excessively thirsty, I hadn't been going to the loo all the time. But she asked me to come back for a blood test first thing the next morning. Uh, she said, just, just to get it out of the way, of course, nothing to worry about, but, but make sure you're here first thing when we open. Um, and I, I went back the next morning, had the blood test done, um, went to work, and then got a phone call on my lunch break. And I was told by the doctor that I was, and I quote, in the diabetic range. Um, of course, I had tons of questions. First one being, what does in the diabetic range actually mean? And he said, uh, you're diabetic, uh, over the phone. And uh, I wanted to know, was I going to die early? Would I have to inject myself? Would I be able to have children? And he couldn't answer those questions for me, especially not about injecting. They still didn't know what type I was. I think my reading, my fasting blood sugar had been 15 or something like that. So obviously high, but they just said I didn't fit either category. And as I said, I was someone at the time who had a phobia of needles. I once fainted in a biology A-level class when we were watching a video showing someone pricking their finger, not, not even injecting. Um, and I once needed three people to get a blood sample from me at the doctor's, one holding me down, one putting a cold cloth on my head, and then they had to call in the actual doctor to, uh, to take, take the blood. Um, so having diabetes was far from ideal. And funnily enough, actually, there had been an even earlier time when I possibly could have got diagnosed 
again about a year before that, um, when my ex-boyfriend's uncle was testing everyone's blood sugar with his glucometer for fun <laughs> before, a, before a family wedding, and I refused because of, you guessed it, that fear of needles. So, understandably, I had all of these questions for the doctor there on the other end of the phone while I struggled to hold it all together in the corridor outside the loos at work. And I asked him, what can I eat? I mean, I can just about laugh at it now, but I was told to check the backs of packets for everything I ate and to avoid it if it had sugar in it. Um, this was a Friday lunchtime and he couldn't see me until the Monday. Uh, I imagined a life without chocolate and was horrified. He told me that I would have to educate my palate, again quoting his words, uh, not to like sweet things, forever. So, I mean, it, he talked about educating my palate, but with 14 years hindsight, I would now very much like to educate this doctor as to what not to say with someone who has just been diagnosed with a lifelong condition and is understandably having a bit of a freak out. And it's infuriating that he didn't have that basic knowledge or the understanding about diabetes or the compassion for that matter to reassure me when I was scared and alone and I needed help the most. And it actually took a little while, like I said, to work out if I was type one or type two. I kept being told that I was very unusual, which is always helpful and that I, I didn't really fit either category. Um, so we just, we just didn't know. They started me on metformin for a couple of months and then that really wasn't doing, doing the job. So um, on, to, on to injections it was eventually. And I had to work out how on earth I was going to be able to do this every day, several times a day. Uh, I remember actually asking the nurse if I could uh, try it on an orange first <laughs> once I was given the, uh, the pen and she refused saying, but uh, you're not an orange? There we go. <laughs> You're not an orange. Um, but I, I also want to know what it would mean for my career, which, as I said, was just beginning. Would I be okay to drive? Uh, would I be able to go abroad? Or would stress affect my blood sugars? And what about those long hours that we do as journalists? And I can be a, a pretty stubborn person, as those who know me can attest to. And I was determined, though, from the start, that I would try my hardest to make sure that this wonky pancreas that had decided to attack itself didn't affect my ability to do my job or to live my life. If I made mistakes, that was on me, not my health condition. I also made sure I was open about it from the beginning at work. I wanted people to ask me about it, and I wanted to tell them all about it, not least so they would know what to do in an emergency. But that's been a running theme, actually, in my life with diabetes, that kind of real need and urge to communicate with people. Perhaps it's down to me being a journalist, but I truly believe that communication is key. I want those questions, uh, just as long as that question isn't, oh, but you can't have that cake, can you? And I think it's so important to open a dialogue and get rid of some of those misconceptions that still exist. I think we know them all too well. I'm always shocked when I hear people who I know and would otherwise respect saying things like, oh, can your sugar go too high as well as too low? Oh, oh type one, you must have been born with that from when you were a baby. Uh, and did you eat a lot of sugar when you were a child? And insulin makes your sugar go up, doesn't it? And you'd better believe that every time I see a diabetes story crop up on the BBC website that my team hasn't written, of course, uh, I'm, I'm right in there with a metaphorical red pen making sure they've differentiated between types 1 and type 2 and fully explained diabetes to the reader. I should say that 99% of the time, of course, on the BBC news website, it's, it's, it's obviously fine, uh, but it's just that a bit more information is needed sometimes. I remember being told when I was first diagnosed that I would have to be the expert in my diabetes, not, not the doctor, not the diabetes nurses, but I had to know everything about it. And sometimes it does feel like I'd be able to have it as my specialist subject at Masterminds. But it's only when I realised that uh, when I came to write this talk that I've not written about my diabetes all that much, actually. There's the odd case study that I've done for our health reporters, most recently about getting the Libra, actually, which I've got on here, on the NHS. Um, and it's proved, as I'm sure lots of you know, it's proved a real game changer to me as the long shifts and funny hours can do funny things to my blood sugar as well. But my trusty finger pricker and test strips have actually accompanied me along the way to some pretty interesting places so far. 
I've tested my blood sugar inside Buckingham Palace while waiting for an investiture ceremony, it's the one where people get made into MBEs, OBEs, dames and things, uh, and hoping that my levels would behave while I was doing interviews with the celebrity recipients. And inside Windsor Castle, again for an investiture ceremony, um, through no fault of my own, I arrived red-faced, sweaty, hugely out of breath, uh, because the press officer had managed to take us the wrong way into the, into the castle. I had a really horrible cold too, and suddenly felt very faint, hence the Queen's nurse looking every bit as matronly and starched and, and caring as you'd expect. Uh, she made me check my levels, which were a bit high, but otherwise okay, and I was pres prescribed Lemsip and some rest, <laughs> although somewhat, somewhat unlikely in this job actually managing to get rest, but I did, I did make it through the, uh, through the ceremony. I think that was actually the time that I managed to get a, a dirty look from the Queen, which is one of my claims, <laughs> claims to fame, because when the ceremonies um, finished, I was still doing an interview, and I was told, right, when the Queen comes through, you have to be silent and kind of do a little bow or a curtsy. So I was interviewing someone, had my eyes on the door, like going, yep, Julie writing the notes. And then I realized, well, why has everyone gone quiet? Looked behind, she was coming from another door <laughs> and there was me talking and she you know, shot, me, shot me a look. <laughs> so I, I did a very awkward curtsy. Um, but it wasn't long after that that I swapped the, the posh loos at Windsor Castle to those at uh, Glastonbury Festival. There I am in some interesting wellies. Um, yeah, it was in the name of work, surprisingly, and saw me camping in the press area, which is perched precariously on the side of a hill. Uh, and all I'll say is that cider definitely isn't good for blood sugars, if you've not learned that, uh, learned that already. Uh, during the festival, I was lucky enough to stand on the side of the stage while Elvis Costello was performing, and also to meet Liam Gallagher, uh, you can see there, um, and to get a hug off him as well, which um, I'll, I'll try and cut a long story short, but basically when I was a teenager, I'd seen him walking along outside a festival uh, and being a teenager, it was before smartphones, so I couldn't ask for a selfie. Uh, I ran up to him going, oh, you're Liam Gallagher, aren't you? Can I have your autograph? And um, he swore at me <laughs> and, and said, no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, several years on um, at, the, at the festival when he was saying, oh, you know, any, any more questions? I said, yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> why did you tell me to F off <laughs> when I was 16? Um, so yeah, all these years on, he was slightly more sober and uh, was totally mortified at what he had said to a younger me when I brought it up. And uh, yeah, we don't have the hugging picture, but we did, we hugged it out. So it was all fine. <laughs> um, and just speaking about music festivals, actually, uh, which is a big love of mine, um, there is also the Isle of Wight Festival I went to a couple of years ago, and I ended up inadvertently um, helping out a, a fellow person with type 1. Uh, but again, I came across people's misconceptions around diabetes. I actually noticed him. I was going to one of the stages. I can't remember who I was seeing. Um, because as I was walking, I saw a pack of AccuCheck test strips on the ground, which is the brand that, that I use and kind of did a double take thinking, oh, have I dropped mine, even though they were <laughs> in front of me. Um, and so I, I went back realizing that he was someone with diabetes as well. Uh, his own brother was with him, who might have had too much of a substance, which wasn't insulin. Uh, <laughs> he was dancing around with a bra over his T-shirt, I seem to remember. And he said that he thought his brother um, might need some more insulin, even though he was very clearly, to me, having a hypo, sat there on the floor, bright white, head in his hands. Um, a woman standing at the merchandise store next to where we were uh, tutted and muttered something about people being drunk in the middle of the day. Um, but yeah, I got his brother to do the blood sugar reading eventually. That took a, <laughs> that took a little while. Um, but I was worried if I was to do it myself that he might lash out at me, being a, being a total stranger. Uh, and I saw, when I saw his levels were 3.1, gave him glucose tablets and a flapjack, and when the paramedic arrived, uh, it had actually gone down to 2.5. Um, I saw him around the festival the following day, and I'm pretty sure he didn't even recognize me. Uh, but knowing how, from experience just how rotten anything starting with a 2 feels, be that 2 or 22, I can't really blame him. Uh, and my work, as I was saying, has also taken me to Cannes for the film festival, uh, which wasn't unfortunately just hours of film watching and champagne drinking, although I managed a little bit of that, um, but also press conferences, interviews, uh, screenings starting at the crack of dawn. 
I think my most glamorous moment there was probably sipping fizz alongside the likes of Cara Delevingne, a magnum ice cream party. You actually got to customise your own magnum as well, which was even more exciting than the champagne. Um, my least glamorous moment was probably having a, a hypo in my Ibis hotel room, which was about two miles from the main town centre, uh, joylessly eating the microwave meal that they'd had to warm up for me <laughs> around midnight. Uh, but five hours sleep and I was ready to go again. And as an entertainment reporter, which I actually did for a, a two-year stint on the BBC website, I'm back to doing UK news, which unfortunately involves Brexit and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when I was doing entertainment, um, Strictly, where well, Strictly became very much uh, my, my thing, they were the lovely Ed Balls and Katia. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to Elstree a couple of times during each season to, uh, to interview some of the stars of the show, uh, attend the press conferences like the day before the final, um, and I also covered the series of Strictly for local radio, which uh, involved being on air at 6.30 a.m. Um, and I also got to go to some of the shows at Elstree and up at Blackpool as well. And it's true what they say about places looking much smaller in real life. The dance floor is actually tiny, and so were the chairs that they put the audience in. But it's like they have people with diabetes in mind, though, as you get a little juice box and a Kit Kat uh, on the chairs for the, the break between shows. Um, perfect of the hot studio lights and, uh, and the stress of cheering on your favourite has brought on high sugar levels. Well, or a hypo. No, a hypo, that's the right way around. Isn't it? Uh, I mean, we're talking stress. Try facing Anne Robinson across the Weaker's Link studio. There I am with my... Pudsy, pudsy ears on. Luckily, this was not actually aired, uh, which is good, but there was a special journalist um, edition, and I kept on having to tell myself, it's not real, it's not real, but uh, Anne Robinson is, yeah, <laughs> not, the, not the cuddliest of people. Um, but probably the thing that I'm most proud of work-wise so far is covering the Oscars last year over in L.A., um, and the dress, of course, is a, a huge thing, and everyone has the choice of either wearing a full-length dress or a tuxedo. I went for the dress. Um, but this being LA, I wanted to show my arms if I wasn't going to be showing my legs, uh, partly because it's hot, but you, know, you don't want to be too covered up on the red carpet. So, yeah, as Joe was saying, that meant showing my Libra as well. There is, I am on the red carpet with the Oscar. Um, I was self-funding that at the time, but it was great to be able to kind of wear it... Uh, wear it with pride. And people ask me, obviously, what it's like going to the Oscars, standing there on the red carpet, and I can honestly tell you that surreal is the word that stands out. But I was proud, too, and especially when someone backstage asked me, oh, excuse me, is that, is that thing for diabetes? I really want to try one of those. I've heard that they're great. Uh, and, yeah, as I said, I like to think it was the first, uh, first Libra on the, on the red carpet. And it was tricky balancing the food and the sleep and the heat, especially when it was sweltering hot that day. Uh, the whole week was a bit of a, a whirl, but just some insider snippets. Um, is that there's a man whose job it actually is to hoover the red carpet as the guests are coming on. Um, on the red carpet, you're kind of streamed into whether you're A-list or B-list. There's actually three lanes with the A-listers kind of going on the side away from all the journalists so they can just go straight in there. Uh, and then a row of security, and then the people, maybe B or C listers, who are actually happy to talk to us, uh, closest to us there. Um, oh, and the other thing I learned in LA is that people actually do eat in Hollywood, which, uh, which really surprised me, and I was, I was very pleased that there was a press buffet outside the, uh, the interview room. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a great week. I met uh, Luke Skywalker. There's, a, there's me trying to take a selfie with Mark, <laughs> with Mark Hamill. <laughs> We were in the same, it, it kind of counts. Um, but yeah, I interviewed Olivia Walker. I went to a party where Emma Stone was there. And uh, while I was there, I managed to stand on someone's dress in my new look heels. <laughs> but, but never mind. Uh, and the night, the night of the ceremony itself ended uh, not with an after party, but eating pizza in the BBC office where I was until two o'clock in the morning writing my pieces. But it's not all excitement being a, a journalist, uh, a lot of time is spent in that newsroom that we saw before, putting in phone calls and emails, waiting for responses, watching news wires come in. Uh, and a few weeks ago, I had a bit of an unusual experience, which was doing a course on how to cover large protests and riots 
And before you say what good timing that is <laughs> with what's happening politically, um, it is actually ahead of me going out to Washington DC in July for six months where I'm going to be a news feature writer. So this training course involved two days at the Met Police Training Center in Gravesend. And there's me closing my eyes at the horror <laughs> of it all. Um, they've actually built a fake town there uh, for the Met Police to do their training. Um, and they let, they let journalists tag along too as well for our own training. They really do make it feel like the real thing that you get kitted out in this attractive uh, police armor and overalls. Uh, and you actually have petrol bombs thrown at you as well, which was a, <laughs> a novel experience. Um, yeah, of course, the threat of a hypo can feel scarier than someone throwing a, a brick at you. Um, so I made sure our instructor, is he, no, when our instructor was taking the picture, I think, he had to carry my kit around inside his overalls, looking like he was kind of a few months pregnant or something. Um, not that a real rioter would let you stop to check your blood sugars, mind you, but let's hope I never find out. So my job has taken me to some exciting places and led me to do some exciting things as it's going to this summer as well. And I hope you'll agree that I don't think my diabetes has ever stopped me doing anything, well, apart from night shifts, actually. But um, I found my sugar levels went like a roller coaster overnight. But for some reason, I didn't complain too much about not having to work, <laughs> work overnight. Uh, if anything, actually, having this condition has made me a, a stronger person. I had battled a bit with self-confidence uh, and with being shy uh, before I was diagnosed, but having this change thrust upon me and the other autoimmune condition, which is uh, wonky platelets to add to my wonky pancreas, um, made me realise that life is for living, to learn to take more responsibility for myself, and to take every opportunity that I possibly can, and to trust myself as well. And outside of work, I've lived in Sydney for four months. I've gone traveling on my own, uh, where I did a skydive. Um, I've been a judge at the World Cheese Awards <laughs> last November. Um, and I even half walked, half ran the London Marathon with mm, just about no training. <laughs> but somehow my sugar level stayed in target the whole way round. I kept checking, going, if it's too high, I'll just have to pull out. And he was like, no, it was absolutely perfect. Um, but yeah, it was some, some kind of sugar level miracle. But anyone out there thinking of doing a marathon with no training, please, please don't. I couldn't walk for a week afterwards. Um, diabetes has also taught me something else. I've always loved meeting new people and the diabetes community online, especially as I've got more involved with it over the past couple of years, has been a, a genuine delight and also a place that I know I can go for help, advice or just a good old moan any time of the day or night. That kind of support both on Twitter and Facebook is invaluable and I thank all of you here today for being a part of that club. And just going back to those questions that I asked my doctor when I was diagnosed, I wish that I had had the answers that I needed, the ones which showed me how my life would go on to be. Yes, you need to carry snacks with you at all times. Yes, you have to field annoying questions sometimes. Yes, it can be stressful meeting deadlines, churning out copy under trying circumstances up against the clock, but you know that you're going to be all right. And now as I'm on the verge of my American adventure, I won't be living there, but you know, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere similar. But now as I'm about to head there, I really wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you very much for listening.